Hi, I'm Joe Polizzi, and this is the Content Inc. Podcast. Five minutes every Monday for content creators who desire to be content entrepreneurs. Happy Thursday again, everyone. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the last 10 weeks of special Thursday episodes. The downloads that you have, so thanks for listening. Our last podcast in the Content Inc. book tour series is with my friend John Lee Dumas. I met John when he was just starting out, and he found that there were no daily podcasts for entrepreneurs, and that became his tilt, his differentiation, and now he's a multimillionaire living in Puerto Rico. You'll love his story. Enjoy. So, okay, I'm going to start this off. JLD, Entrepreneurs on Fire has become one of those po- one of the most popular podcasts out there, especially, I would say, for entrepreneurs. I'm sure you know the exact statistics on that. But what I want to start with here, just the level set, give the audi- tell, tell the audience where you're at today with Entrepreneurs on Fire as a business and give me your three-minute or so origin story on how the heck you got this thing started. Cool. So in three minutes, um, I'm just a, a kid from Maine, just like uh, you're a, a kid from Ohio, Joe. I think you originated there. No, oh, yeah, and, you got it. Yeah. And uh, grew up in a very small town, which I loved, and decided to uh, kind of hit the big city for college. I went to college in Rhode Island on a, Providence specifically, on a Army ROTC scholarship, and then spent the next eight years post-college as an officer in the U.S. Army, as a tank commander in charge of four tanks, 16 men, and did a 13-month tour of duty in Iraq, which was pretty intense for a 23-year-old who just got done four years of having zero responsibility in college to all the responsibility as a armor platoon leader. And then after my military service, I just tried a bunch of things and failed. I went through what I call my six years of struggle. And I mean it. It was six years, and it was all struggle. It was law school dropping out. It was corporate finance quitting. It was a failed tech startup as an employee. It was uh, residential real estate, commercial real estate during the real estate bear market and all that jazz. And I finally, at the age of 32 years old, decided that it was time and I was ready um, to start my own entrepreneurial journey. And it was inspired by reading the right books, um, uh, you know, great books that, you know, Joe's written many of and other amazing entrepreneurs. And then listening to the audiobooks while I was in my car doing a little automobile university. And then also being able to um, transition over to podcasts, which was a medium in 2012 that was a pretty small niche, niche medium, but one that I immediately connected with, like a lot of people have connected with Clubhouse recently as a medium, where I just got it immediately. I was like, this is free, on-demand, and targeted content. That's incredible. That's an incredible trifecta. I love it. It's the right price. It's the right target. It's on-demand. I'm able to choose what I want to listen to, when I want to listen to it. This just makes sense to me. And I became a rabid consumer of podcasts. And I fell in love specifically with podcasts that interviewed entrepreneurs. And I got to know the the hosts, not personally, but just through their voice, their interviews, and realized that, hey, these are just people that are like in their closet, in their bedroom, um, interviewing other inspiring people and sharing a lot of great value with the world. I can do this. And I wanted something like this because I know that on the average of the five people I spend the most time with, so I need to up my, my five. And so back in 2012, I decided to launch the first daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs. And I like to tell people the day that I launched, it was the best daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs. It was also the worst. It was literally the only daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs, which was one of my magical formulas uh, back in the day. I was the only, I was the only show in town on a daily basis. and identifying that void was the the biggest reason for my initial success finding an underserved market was the reason why i got the initial traction and then committing to the consistency of doing a daily podcast for 2000 days in a row for 5 uh, and a half years without missing a single day and that consistency led to the show where it is today where i now have over 3000 episodes published um, over 100 million listens of the show with over a million monthly listens. 
Um, it's afforded me the opportunity to, to launch a variety of revenue streams, obviously sponsorships being a big one, but also courses like my, my podcasting course, Podcasters Paradise, other courses I've done over the years, physical journals that I've created like Freedom Journal, Mastery Journal, Podcast Journal. Um, I recently published my first traditionally published book, which you can see more about in my bio, The Common Path to Uncommon Success. And, um, you know, has afforded me now my 92nd month in a row of having a net profit in my business of $100,000 or more for 92 months in a row, which we've published um, every month for those 92 months on our on our website, eofire.com, where we bring our, our lawyer on for a legal tip, our accountant on for a tax tip, and just try to bring transparency, openness, and honesty, and trust to an industry that um, is getting a lot better at it, but frankly, for a while, was struggling with, with a lot of those things and wanting to kind of be that beacon of, like, this is actually how we're doing it. Here's an insight, a, a, a not just a peak, but just a whole you know, shebang of how we run our business and how we generate revenue in that. So that's the quick version of it, Joe. Um, and uh, thanks for giving the opportunity. No, that's good. No, I, I have so, there's so many things I want to unpack. First of all, I think your audio is fading a little bit in and out. Try hitting the ellipses, uh, John, and, and putting it on high volume type, if you would, and see if that helps a little bit. Because you're, it's on, you're kind of go from stereo to. to I mind. just did that, and I did not even know that was an option. Oh, is no. that better? Yeah, there, there you go. That's a little bit better. We'll see. That should that should work okay. So I, you're in a couple parts of the Content Inc. book. Um, I, I almost I want to go. I want to talk about your differentiation because it's really important. But you made the decision early to have this be a lifestyle business for you because we talked about this a lot on the tilt. What's your exit strategy? Do you want to sell? Do you want to be big? You you were very specific and say, I want this to be a lifestyle business. I can make enough money. I want to do all the things I want. Financial independence is really important. Did you specifically set out and as a goal that was, that was and like, what, tell us the process about that. Is that something you wrote down? Is that something you came to as you worked the podcast? What did you do with that? Absolutely. And definitely jump back in if uh, my audio starts to fade again, because I do have my AirPods in. So I could go to just um, holding the phone up to my face as well. If that's you got it. You got it. Right now you sound good. Go ahead. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's definitely been an evolving process, Joe, because a lot of times you don't know what you don't know. And I didn't really know the kind of business that I wanted to be running ten year, in 10 years, 10 years ago when I launched Entrepreneurs on Fire. I just didn't know what I didn't know. And I think that's okay. And um, for me, I, I knew that I wanted to grow an audience. I wanted to serve that audience. And I wasn't going to get caught up in thinking too hard about my three to five year plan, knowing that things could shift, the world could change, my desires, my goals, my, my wishes, my, my, my definition of success and my definition of happiness could all adjust as well. And so I was, I was very open to that reality. And you know, talking to a successful entrepreneur every single day really helped that because I got to speak with a lot of people who are at varying degrees of their business and life. And I got to hear their answer to the question I asked every single one of them is, which uh, is, which was um, share with me your biggest struggle right now or your biggest entrepreneurial failure. And hearing the failures, I kept finding this theme of people just, you know, thinking that growth was the only strategy and that they, they, they built this huge team, then the economy shifted and they were left, you know, destitute with this, you know, massive payroll and, you know, all these advertising expenses and this, you know, potentially even like business space. And, and it just seemed like, you know, every so often talking to these and interviewing these entrepreneurs, that just kind of became this very consistent theme in people's businesses and lives. They were having this like boom and bust cycle. And I said, well, there's nothing wrong with that because some people never have that boom and bust cycle. And some people actually thrive in kind of a boom or bust cycle. And like, that's what people wanted. But for me, like I, I felt myself drawn to more of a simpler business model where I would have the ability to go on a 75 or 90 day vacation every year, which of course was not years one through years four, but years five and beyond myself and Kate have taken those two to three month vacations every single year where we've essentially unplugged, you know, minus, you know, the basic email management um, and just running of the business from abroad that we've done. And, you know, that, that was more appealing to me and actually having, the ability to, you know, weather some storms that may come, you know, uh, ahead of us. If, you know, we do have, you know, uh, massive inflation or if we have, you know, a, a recession or even depression that looms ahead of us, you know, maybe or maybe not. It could be 
one month from now, it could be 100 years from now or somewhere in between. And having the kind of the flexibility of saying, you know, I, I know that I have a lean, mean team to huddle into that appealed to me. And that was a business that I wanted to run. And that's what I kind of evolved into after a few years of running my own business and seeing what that was like. And then again, as importantly, being engaging and um, really understanding what and how other people were running their businesses and where they seem to trip up most of the time when they had those big trip ups. And so that just kind of evolved to now where, you know, we're running a multi-million dollar a year business net profits in Puerto Rico, where we pay a flat 4% tax rate, no federal tax, no state tax. I like to say we have to keep all the money that we make down here. And my team is five people. It's myself and Kate and three virtual assistants, two in the Philippines, one in Pakistan. And like that allows us to run our business very seamlessly, very flawlessly, because, and this is something that I, I mentioned to you, Joe, uh, I, I, I have found what enough is for me. And do I have a goal to run an eight-figure-a-year business? I don't. My current goal is not to run an eight-figure-a-year business because I know what it would take time-wise, energy-wise, bandwidth-wise to grow my business from a couple million dollars a year and to 5x that to 10 to $15 million per year. And I don't want to make that trade-off because working um, you know, 10x harder to make 5x the revenue or whatever that those numbers would end up being is not a trade-off I personally want to make as an individual. And I found what enough is in my business. And I think that if a lot more people earlier in their careers really sat down and thought what enough looked like, they would be surprised. And that would seem so much more attainable than just what it seems to be purveying in this world, which is just more, more, more. Um, I've got a ton of follow-ups with that one. JLD, can you, can you try off the Air- AirPods and see if that helps a little bit? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's just going in and out. We can still hear you. So everybody's still getting the quality content. Oh, I think what the, the best thing I love about what you said is start off with the goals and what enough is enough and really figure that out. It doesn't have to be a formal exit. It could be a lot of different things, but I don't think a lot of content creators start out thinking, this is my why, this is what do I want to accomplish, this is where I want to be in three or five years, at least to write it down and figure out. And those things change over time, but but I think you've done, you did that, and that made all the difference with you. Um, let's talk about your, what we call in the, in the content ink book, your content tilt, your differentiation. Do you think your differentiation was because you became a daily podcast and there was nothing else out there, or was it something else? I absolutely do. What I recommend a lot of people do, and more so now than ever before, because we're just becoming a louder, crazier, more chaotic and saturated society every single day, is you need to look at the areas that you're passionate about, that you're excited about, that you have value and skills to give to the world and say, what do I complain about in these areas? What do I think is missing in these areas? What's a void in this specific marketplace? Like, What is an underserved part of this market. So instead of just jumping in and trying to kind of like go up against the big boys and big girls that are already established and and are rocking and rolling it, saying, well, they're doing a lot of things right. What's like one or two things that they're doing wrong or one or two things that they could be doing a lot better? And like asking yourself that question, that's where you're going to have some legitimate opportunity. And that's exactly what I asked myself with these great podcast hosts. I'm like, these podcast hosts are doing a lot of things right. But what's something they're doing wrong? Like, what do I find myself potentially complaining about when, you know, I'm listening to their shows? And one of those things was that I had to wait literally seven days for the next episode to be released when I was like getting so motivated by this that I just wanted to do it every single day. I wanted to get get that content every single day and it just wasn't available. And so I said, there's the void, there's the opportunity, let me go all in. And everything we've done since then, I've gone into that marketplace with that same mentality of like, you know, I got really into journaling in 2016 and I said, well, what's missing in the journaling world? And I just realized that so many people in 2016 were just producing these virtual journals for people just to like have fillable PDFs because it was just easier, cheaper, and you know, essentially no cost to do. And there was just a dearth of actual physical journals that people could like have on their nightstands and like write in and like kind of create some kind of legacy around. Um, and that to me was like really interesting and appealing. So I decided to test the market with a crowdfunding campaign 
with the Freedom Journal, and I used Kickstarter to test the, pro- the product, saying, "Hey, what would you, it look like if I gave you, if I created a journal that in 100 days will guide you to accomplish your number one goal in those 100 days? If I get enough crowdfunding behind this, I will create this journal. I will make it happen, and I will distribute it to my backers. And in 33 days, we had 453 thousand dollars pledged." to a $39 journal, which of course proved the concept and has now gone on to sell millions of dollars via Kickstarter and then um, onto Amazon and our Shopify store, et cetera, which led me to then release uh, three more journals over the next three years, continuing to kind of prove that concept in the same manner. And you know, other, other projects that we've done, I've always used that same mentality. And so that's one area that I think is more necessary today than it's ever been before is that whole idea of identifying the void and becoming the best solution to a real problem in that in that void in that um, underserved market first of all you're coming in loud and clear now so that worked perfectly um second of all i love i love the take on differentiation i don't think a lot of people think about serving their audience like you do you're like who's the audience how can i serve them what are their problems instead we want to we want to sell things, and I, right, you know, I get that, but we we have to make sure we serve first. Let's talk, first of all, just to reset the room real quick. I know we got a lot of new people in the room. We're talking to John Lee Dumas, founder of Entrepreneurs on Fire, and how he built his podcast and his business. You're part of the Content Inc. book tour, JLD. Um, I want to talk to you about your focus on podcasting because what we see a lot of content entrepreneurs do is they have an idea, even if they have a really good one about serving their audience, and then they. They want to start the podcast. They want to do the YouTube thing. They want to be on Facebook groups. They want to do everything at once. And what you did really well is you focused on podcasting as the way that you were going to build your audience. Can you talk about your decision to do that? Am I right when I even say that? Uh, And what would you recommend to other content entrepreneurs moving forward? Did that focus on the podcast work for you? I'm a big believer in that word as just a word, focus, which is follow one course until success. And I mean, I just got off a call right before this where, you know, I'm somebody just joined Podcasters Paradise. They joined our elite plan. So they get a 15 minute call with me and I'm talking this guy through and, you know, it's 2021. He's like, yeah, so I have this idea for a podcast where I'm, you know, going to interview entrepreneurs and I'm going to have them share their story. Cause I feel like, you know, people need to hear stories. And I'm like, you're completely right. Like people do need to hear stories. They love hearing stories. You know, congratulations on being the 3,462nd podcast to launch in the past 10 years with that exact idea and that exact concept. And that's exactly why you're going to fail. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, he was taken aback and he was a little shocked by it. But I'm like, listen, like you didn't invest, you know, a lot of money to have this 15 minute call with me for me to be your cheerleader. I'm saving you months, if not years of your time by saying this your podcast will fail. Like who's going to listen to your podcast over my podcast, over Lewis House's podcast, over how I built this, over Pat Flynn's podcast? Nobody, because you're not going to be a good podcaster when you start. And you're going against great podcasters who are doing the exact same thing that you're talking about, not to mention the thousands of other terrible podcasters who are clogging up the space and saturating the market that you're going to become now one of because it takes time to get good at anything. Instead, you need to say, okay, I understand the concept and the big idea that I have where I I want to interview people about their stories and share tactics and strategies and go from that vague, broad, you know, terrible idea in 2021, which would have been a great idea for you to do in 2011, um, but it's not 2011, and say, what is the one void in this marketplace that I am uniquely qualified and skilled in and have passion behind that I can become the best solution to that problem with a podcast? What is something that John's not doing, that Pat, that Lewis, that the thousands of other podcasters that are interviewing entrepreneurs, you know, now there's 2021 and everybody's, you know, feeling like this is a gold mine after Joe Rogan, um, you know, got a hundred million dollars from Spotify. And, you know, I just locked in a seven, a seven figure deal with HubSpot. And it's like, there's so much money in this space now, but guess what? There's a reason that these companies are giving Joe and myself, um, so much money. Like Joe Rogan's been doing this since 2008. I've been doing this since 2012. I have over a hundred million lists. I have an established audience and they want that audience and they're having to pay for it to get exposure to that audience in a meaningful way. 
And there's a reason why the thousands of podcasters that are coming out with these vague, broad podcasts are failing, 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 because there's no differentiator. There's nothing different or unique about it. Um, and so the biggest piece of advice that I gave this individual, which I've already kind of alluded to, is there are absolutely voids in every marketplace. There are absolutely struggles and challenges that are not being solved right now. You just need to find that carve that niche out, become the best solution to that one single problem and stick at that. And then you will win. And then maybe two years from now we can talk and you can have an audience and you can have a brand and an understanding and, and potentially some skills as a podcast host because you've been putting in the reps consistently. And now we can talk about, hey, what area do you want to expand into? How do you want to broaden out from where you're at now? If you even want to at that point, or maybe you've just fallen in love with your niche and want to keep dominating it. That is how people are winning in the podcasting game and really just in the entrepreneurship game in 2021 and beyond. And I'll be saying the exact same thing in 2031 and 2041 because this has even been more sped up over time because of what's happened in this world with pandemic, et cetera. And it's something that's so important for people to realize now more than ever. No, I don't think people realize that for the last hundred years, great media companies have been built on focusing on on one core platform to start and then diversifying, which you've done really well. And a lot of content entrepreneurs get in there and they want to launch everything at the same time. And if you look at, okay, why do most content entrepreneurs fail? First is you're right. It's they don't have a differentiation. And second is they don't deliver consistently over time. So let's break that down for you because what I'd love to hear is your timetable from start to when you, let's say, made your first dollar JLD to when you knew you had something or when the, you had enough money that was either profitable or could support yourself and your team. So uh, give us an idea of how long it takes because that's when people, they, they quit between that six-month and and 16-month mark, and that's sort of the sweet spot where you really get going. So I had a lot of ideas when I launched about how I was going to make money. I mean, remember um, <laughs> telling my my podcast mentor, who I I hired three months before my launch, Jamie Masters of The Eventual Millionaire. She's a very um, successful and great podcast coach and host of her own show. And I hired her and, you know, we had a great um, coaching session uh, pre-launch and then post-launch where she guided me through a lot of great things. And, you know, one of the things she kept harping on is like, well, how are you going to generate revenue? How are you going to make money? And I had a lot of ideas. And she said, you know, a lot of those ideas are crap because that's just not how you're going to be able to make money for various reasons at the beginning because you're not going to have an audience. You're not going to have any momentum or traction. You're not going to have any credibility and the authority and the influence. And, and she was right on all of those things. But it is kind of interesting, like looking back, like a lot of those things that I said as ideas back then were not um, possible at the time for all those reasons I just shared, but I have actually come to fruition. And like one example I can give directly is I said, well, wait a second. I'm like, if, if I, you know, have an audience that's, you know, a large audience and people want to come on to my show to like talk about their book, their products, their services, their area of expertise, whatever that might be, they'll want to pay for that platform. Right. And Jamie was like, oh no, like people are never going to pay to be on podcast because, you know, podcasts are free and they, you'll be lucky to get enough guests on your show, let alone ever having people pay to be guests on your show. And so she kind of shot that idea down, which she was right at the time. That was never going to happen at the beginning part of my journey, but all things come to those who wait. And, you know, for three years now, it's been a $3,500 and sometimes even more, depending on my actual supply that I have, appearance fee to be a guest on Entrepreneurs on Fire. And, you know, that was something I decided to go into uh, like seven years into my podcasting journey where I was getting over 400 inbound applications and requests and inquiries to be on the show every single month, you know, for what I had at the time was like, you know, 20 or 30 spots to be on the show. And I was like, this is obviously a supply and demand thing. Let's test out an earlier idea that I had to potentially generate some revenue. And, you know, to be frank, they cut the wheat from the chaff. Like people that can't invest $3,500 to be an entrepreneur is on fire frankly, are not an entrepreneur on fire in, this, in the sense of the term that I have for my show where people are crushing it in business and life. And those people that can afford $3,500 to be a guest on my show obviously get the massive exposure from being on Entrepreneurs on Fire with over a million listens per month, but also are 
correctly and you know provingly running a thriving business where they can invest that kind of money in themselves for a 20 or 30 minutes interview on a podcast. And so it's actually made like my team's job so much easier. It's really in, in a lot of ways improve the quality of my guests, the people that are kind of self-qualifying by even being able to raise their hands and apply when, you know, our first question is before you apply, know that if you get selected, it's a $3,500 appearance fee. And a lot, so that's cut down on a lot of applications. People that are like, well, I can't or won't pay that fee. Great. Totally understand. You shouldn't and you, and, and, and you shouldn't. Um, but the people that do were like, okay, these are obviously experts in their niche. Let's look at their application very closely and see if they're a fit for our show. And some aren't, and that's fine. And some are, and that's great. And I can honestly also tell you, to continue kind of down this same thread, that people who invest $3,500, guess what? They show up to the podcast on time. They have good audio quality. They are invested in having the show be a success. So they are sharing with their audience in a very meaningful manner. They are proud to be on the show and they want to make the most of their appearance. And gone are the days where I have somebody be like, oh, what are we doing again here? Like my assistant must have booked this for me. Like, is this a, this a podcast or is this a YouTube show or something? And not that it happened a lot, but it did happen. And when those kind of things happen, you kind of just shake your head and you're being like, how did this person kind of fall through the cracks? Well, that person <laughs> does not fall through the cracks anymore. And it's um, just one example, again, of something that I was not going to be able to monetize on day one or year one, but, you know, has turned into, you know, like a thirty to $40,000 revenue stream for us every single month going forward. And just, you know, uh, some other things to kind of like, kind of like wrap up this part of the conversation that Joe asked mm -hmm. is um, when we launched the podcast, you know, we literally made almost zero revenue for the first 13 months. I think our, our first income report was a, a year and we did $27,000 of total revenue in that year. Most of that revenue coming at the very end of that first year. And then at month 13, that was when we cracked open one of our codes and we launched a course and we hit $100,000 that month. And that was the start of 92 consecutive months of $100,000 of net profit or more with, by the way, varying degrees of, of, of revenue streams. And like sometimes our biggest revenue streams in 2013, 14, and 15 have become very small revenue streams for us now. And smaller sh revenue streams back then have now become very large for us. So you see the fluctuation, you see the need and the importance of diversifying your revenue stream because things do fluctuate in this market. And when you're trying to generate significant and consistent revenue, you've got to have a lot of alleys that that revenue is coming in on. Oh, I love that number of 13 months. I mean, I talk about this in the book, you know, 22 months. I thought I I, we were, I was a complete failure. I mean, nothing was working, whatever. Well, a year later, we were a multi-million dollar business, but I, you know, you don't know it turns that fast, but you got to hold out for that long. And I love that you're telling people that, you know, you've got to, you've got to build the audience first. And then once you build the audience, then you open up options for many, many different ways to monetize. I'm going to pass it over to, to Ann Ginn. Ann, I think you have got a question, but I know we're going to put it out for questions and answers. So if anybody's got a question, now would be the time. Yes, definitely. Tap that little uh, hand in the lower right if you have a question, and we'll pull you up to the stage. And actually, my question works very well with what you were both discussing about the 13 months. I'm actually going to go back even earlier where you were talking about 2,000 days to do a podcast. So when you're, how do you stay motivated for that long, but also 13 months of you know, until you're really hitting the numbers you need to from, an in, from a revenue standpoint? It's a lot of work <laughs> to do and to do day after day. You couldn't take a break and such. So I'm curious of how you stay motivated and, and kept going. So you literally start with your big idea. And your big idea is a combination of a couple things. It's your passions, your excitement, your enthusiasm, coupled with your expertise, your skills, value you can add to the world. It's that overflow, that commingling of those things that becomes your zone of fire. And that zone of fire is critical because if you're just launching something that you're knowledgeable in, that you have value to give to the world and that you're an expert in, but you're lacking that other side, that enthusiasm, that passion, that excitement, then you're just going to lose motivation. You're just going to lose momentum and you're just going to eventually give up. But on the flip side, 
and this is where more people make the mistake, in my opinion, is when you just launch on passion, on excitement, on enthusiasm alone, it's just a hobby. And it's fine to have a hobby, but your hobby is not going to be, for most people, where you're making the majority of your money because people are going to be happy that you have a hobby. But unless you're solving their problem to the best of your ability, unless you are providing the number one solution to a real struggle in this world, um, you are not going to have people that are going to exchange their hard-earned dollars for the solution that you've created. So it has to be a combination of both. And so that's what I did right with Entrepreneurs on Fire. I was desperate and desirous and passionate about having conversations and connecting and networking with the world's most inspiring and successful business men and women, with entrepreneurs. Like that was a passion that I had. And because of my time in the military, where public speaking is a very big um, focal point for officers and various things that I've done over the years, I did have some skills, some knowledge, some ability to hold conversations, to communicate with people. Now, the best thing I did was do a daily show so that I quickly went from not not terrible at it, but not great at it, to pretty good, to okay, to not so bad, um, quickly, because I was putting in the reps and doing it super consistently over and over and over again, and getting a little bit better every single time. But from day one, I had that combination, even without me really knowing it. I had the passion, the excitement, the enthusiasm for what Entrepreneurs on Fire was, which was daily conversations with inspiring individuals. And then I also had that value that skill sets that I was able to give to the world, which was the guests that I had on, you know, the Joe Polizzi's of the world were delivering massive value through the platform that I created that my guests were able to consume. So at day one was fitting both sides of that equation, the passion, the excitement, the enthusiasm, and the value, the skills, the expertise. And that was the critical combination that I had, again, with some luck involved, because I maybe didn't do that in that specific way with 100% intention, but that's how it worked out. And now, you know, looking back in hindsight, that's how people win in a major way. They have both of those things going for them at all times. That's a great answer. Yeah. And you, you don't have to have everything you have to plan, but you may not see the patterns and, and everything else. That's kind of, I think sometimes the fun part of it all to get into it. So great. Well, I, we have a question from a podcaster and I think I will pronounce, try to pronounce it correctly. Please correct me. Is it Garima? Yeah, you got it right, Ed. Good. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Hello, everybody. Uh, just will give a little context. So I'm an Indian podcaster. I talk about pop culture here in India, try to break the taboo, uh, talk the stereotypes here. Um, the podcast has been doing well. I only started in the pandemic, so it's a pandemic baby. Uh, but having said that, you know, uh, within one year, we've sort of had a great ta- uh, traction, um, have been featured in, you know, national dailies in India. Um, as somebody who talks about liberation for South Asian women and, uh, you know, a host of other topics, including sexuality, female pleasure, um, uh, you know, things for men and hygiene and, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, my question here is, um, I see I'm, you know, currently I'm in my third season, have around 50 episodes. I, I see my growth to be a little stagnant now. Um, uh, is, you know, do you, I mean, what do you recommend in terms of getting that speed push again? Or sort of, uh, what else do you think am I missing on? Because as much as PR could be generated, that's done um, you know, um, the SEO bit I'm working on, but what else do you think am I missing because my listeners are now stagnant? So a very common question, because this is the plateau that all podcasters, the most successful ones, all the way down to the unsuccessful ones will face are plateaus at multiple times in your journey. So you will always experience these plateaus, no matter if you're doing everything right Um, or everything wrong, or somewhere in the middle, you will always have plateaus with your podcast growth for various reasons. Now, the goal is to break out of those. And can you actually bring her back up on stage? Because I I have a specific question I want to bring back to her before I finish the full response. Um, But um, the secret and the trick is, how do you um, get out of those plateaus 
and actually have a chance to have that next kind of hockey stick or at least up into the right growth going forward. So looking at your profile, I do have a question for you. What does um, breaking the stereotype mean? I'm just, out of, I'm just curious. Um, yes, thank you for asking. So stereotype, of course, we all know, um, you know what it is, but um, stereotype is a word play from stereotype and stri in Hindi language, which is an Indian language, means women and because most of these stereotypes are for women uh, you know at least here in india with all the subliminal conditioning that we've been through uh, so three essentially means women and it's a word play on stereotype so i've just like put the letters here and there and it becomes three o type yeah Cool. Well, I really like that because I haven't seen that before and I think it's really unique and that's you know again one thing going back to what successful podcast hosts really need to do is you need to be carving out a unique niche, like something that you are standing for, like something that you alone are doing. And for me, back in the day, of course, that was being the only daily podcaster who was crazy enough to do an interview podcast 365 days of the year. And so, of course, I was the first mover advantage in that and then got all the exponential success, just like the gold medalist. The gold medalist gets all of the advertising dollars, gets all of the credibility, you know, gets all of the interviews, gets all the sponsorship deals. And the silver medalist literally gets nothing, literally. And I mean, that's it, even if they finished, um, you know, 0.100, one one hundredth of a second behind the gold medalist, doesn't matter, does not matter. And that's why it's so important to be number one. And you're not going to be number one unless you niche, unless you specialize, unless you are unbelievably unique and you just become the best in show. Because people will beat a path to the doorstep of the number one solution to their, to their problem, and they will ignore the second best solution to infinity because nobody cares about the second best solution to their problem. They care about the best solution to their problem. So a direct question that I have for you, Garima, is – how many podcasts have you been a guest on in the last three months? I just gave three interviews in, in the last one week. Um, but if I have to talk overall, um, I think I've been on around 10 podcasts. Yeah. In the last three months? Yes. Okay. That's not terrible. Um, one thing that I really see people in just the overall online space do, and this is a quote from Naval. N-A-V-A-L, is he loves to say that you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. And that is so true. Can you repeat that for me? If you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. And 99% of people in the online world spend the majority of their time playing stupid games. I'm referring a lot to like Instagram influencers and just social media, TikTok dancers, like they're playing stupid games. And by that, I mean, you know, they're doing whatever they can do for more likes, for more follows, for more this, for more that, hoping that one thing goes viral. And even if they win, they're winning a stupid prize, which is nothing, you know, which is, can, can I send you a bottle of shampoo for you to give me a shout out on your Instagram channel? Like that's a stupid prize. And everybody, 99% of people are playing stupid games with the majority of their time. And so even the 1% of those people that are winning are winning stupid prizes. There's very few people who refuse to play stupid games. I am one who will not play a stupid game. I only play games that have amazing prizes, like you know, creating an amazing podcast with a huge audience that then signs a seven figure deal with HubSpot. Like that's not a stupid prize. That's a real meaningful prize that I've achieved because I haven't wasted my time playing st stupid games to get stupid prizes. So that being said, it's kind of a little bit of a roundabout way of saying so many people go into stag stagnant growth of their podcast because they're playing stupid games. They think that their answers are on social media, are through advertising through direct marketing through all these other different things and the problem is they're not doing the most key important thing they can do in the podcasting space which is converting the converted you need to convert the converted that is unbelievably key and important now who in the podcasting space are converted um podcast listeners 
listen to podcasts. They already have the podcast app. They've already listened to podcasts. They've already, un- they understand the medium. They've already carved out time in their day to consume that content on that platform. Those are the converted. Now, the only thing that I am doing that is not scalable in my life right now is being a podcast guest on other podcasts. Because guess what? That's not scalable. If I want to be a guest on another podcast for 30 minutes, that takes 30 minutes of my time, at least, you know, forget about the prep and the, and the, and the shutdown afterwards. So that is not scalable, but that is a smart game because every single person who's listening to that podcast, whether it be 10 people or 10,000 people is a podcast listener. And my focus, my following one course until success is my podcast, Entrepreneurs on Fire. So every single person hearing my voice, and this is why I spend time, by the way, on Clubhouse, because there's a lot of direct correlation and, and, and rollover on Clubhouse with podcasting as well. Most people who are on, pod, on Clubhouse also listen to podcasts, which is really the first medium that I've seen where there is such a um, overlap because of the audio-only format of this, is I spend all of my time that's not scalable, that's not leverageable, that's that one to one time where I'm speaking to one individual on their show, on their platform, OPP, other people's platforms, is on a podcast. Because then when I'm done that show and I've delivered hopefully great value to the listeners and I say, hey, if you are enjoying the type of content that I shared today, I have my own podcast and I know the average podcast listener, that's you, listener, listens to seven podcasts, I want to become one of your seven. Don't stop listening to Garima's podcast. Hers is great. I enjoy being a guest on the show. But make me one of your seven because I deliver amazing value as well. Head over to eofire.com slash subscribe and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And I look forward to having you as a listener and I'm going to deliver you massive value. So I am committed to being a guest on at least 15, that's one five, 15 other podcasts every single month. That is my minimum. Now, when I was on my book launch tour, between January 4th and March 23rd, I was on 345 other podcasts and platforms. I did Facebook Lives and Instagram Lives and some um, clubhouses, of course. Um, But again, I wasn't just trying to drive people to my podcast. I was trying to drive people to buy my book, to pre-order my book. So it was a little bit of a different directive, which is why I was willing to go on Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook and other areas. Um, but I was on 345 other people's platforms over that two and a half month period because I knew that was the best use of my time. And for the past eight years, I've been committed to being on a minimum of 15 other podcasts every single month to just drive my overall brand awareness for my podcast. So one thing that you've just got to commit to and double down on, Garima, is saying to yourself, what stupid games am I playing? Let me audit myself. Like, how am I spending my time like getting a million views of a, of your dance on TikTok is not driving meaningful audience and engagement to your podcast. It might drive a little bit in some, but it's not even the right people in the first place because those aren't the converted. The converted are people that already have podcasting as part of their daily, uh, daily life. They're already converted. So how can you commit to getting on more podcasting platforms, deliver amazing, unique, special value, and bring those listeners over to your platform, and then you can convince them to stay subscribed going forward. And that's going to be how you go from a plateau to consistent growth in the evergreen format that is podcasting. Does that make sense? Wow, I'm I'm incredibly grateful, John. That was such a detailed, you know, answer to to a very simple question, and I'm sure a very repeated question, but. You know, the deep analysis that you've done and the analogy that you've given, I'm definitely going to, I was just literally making notes while you were uh, speaking, but thank you so much, John. Really, really appreciate. Um, I'm going to tune into your podcast next thing now. That's that's awesome. And and Grima, we're going to be putting this on the Content Inc. podcast. So if you uh, didn't get all your notes from that conversation, feel free to listen in. So oh, thank will, you, Anne. That was just a great pitch right there. <laughs> thanks. You know, I, I know a little bit of what I'm doing. Anyways, uh, we will bring Matt up to the stage. Thank you for waiting. What's your question? Joe and Laura, thanks for having me up. JLD, man, long, long time fan. Um, you actually helped inspire me to get into journaling. And now I do a couple different journals a day and I have really dove into self-reflection 
the last few years. So thank you for being a big inspiration and motivation to my life. Um, here's my question. It's kind of a two part question for you. You talk a lot about niches and, and diving deep into them. And, and so currently I'm in the process of starting a new, uh, consulting business. It's fairly niche out the gate, uh, where I'm, I'm going to be helping six figure and low seven figure businesses implement streamline business frameworks. So like business processes, uh, to help them grow. So I kind of already have uh, a, a niche where I'm going after, or, or my ideal client is a service-based type of client. My first part of the question is, how niche should I make that then back-end client of service-based businesses? Is Should I go more than that, knowing that I have, you know, I'm looking at a certain revenue amount of those service businesses or uh, what? I'd love your, your take on that. Well, number one, thank you for the kind words, Matt. Much appreciated. And it is impossible to go to niche when you are starting whatever market you're getting into. It's just impossible. You cannot go to niche to start. Um, The more niche you are, of course, is the quicker that you can broaden and expand out into a little bit more of a broad niche and niche, like as, as soon as you start getting initial momentum and initial traction, which you'll get faster the more niche you do. So I... I'm a huge proponent for starting as niche as possible. And I really do think you are talking about quite a specific, unique niche with the whole concept of you know helping businesses implement a framework so you're already there. I think maybe you could, again, add one or two layers like you're talking about on top of that to even get another layer down niche-wise, which could make sense. But a question I have real quick when I was perusing your profile is... Um, Wait a second. Let me cancel that. Um, when I was looking at your profile, was are you still in the process of, of um, launching Flip the Mic podcast where you're interviewing other podcasters about their story? Yes and no. Um, very long story short, I was on a podcast recently. I'm local in Kansas City. And so it was a, a, a leadership type of podcast. And the guy that I was talking with, he didn't know my time frame, so he kind of called me out, and it completely caught me off guard. And I basically spilled my guts as to what it is, what the <laughs> what the topic is, what I'm going to be doing. Um, so, it, yes, to answer your question, but it's not a a top pressing issue. I, I'm more concerned on trying to get my kind of beta session or beta clients started and, and kind of rolling in my program on the consulting side. And then eventually I'm going to be like my, my, my goal with the flip the mic podcast is I'll be interviewing my ideal clients. So then I can give them direct advice back to them, you know, either during while we're talking about their story and their podcast, uh, and their business or after in kind of a little private session. So yeah, that helps. it does help. Um, your initial concept as you have it in your bio sounds like a waste of time that podcast. And I would just completely scrap that idea a hundred percent as it's not going to benefit you. I don't see it in any way, shape or form going forward. And I would actually scrap the name as well of flip the mic, just cause it's not speaking to anybody. Um, especially if you're not going to do the original concept, which is flipping the mic for podcasters, which kind of makes sense. But again, a waste of a time of a show in my opinion, and instead come up with some actually good branding around business framework implementation. It can literally be that simple so that people who know that they have frameworks they need to implement into their businesses will see your podcast and not be like, flip the mic, is this guy a DJ? And they'll actually be like, wait, is this maybe about implementing business frameworks? Like, that's interesting because that's exactly what I need. And I think it's a great idea, which you kind of you know briefly glazed over. So at least you're thinking in this direction is the fact of actually interviewing your perfect potential clients that you want to bring into this consultancy and you want to actually be a consultant to and coach and mentor and have this podcast, which I do think needs to exist in the world through you, um, be completely about how you are breaking these individuals down, breaking these businesses down, implementing frameworks, and then following up with them every three to six months with success stories and and continued struggles that they're having. And everything that you're doing around this, you're going to be doing anyways um, just through your business. But now this this podcast is going to be a transparent look into what you actually do. It's going to put a spotlight on you and your area of expertise, which is not 
interviewing podcasters about their stories. Now, your area of expertise is implementing business frameworks for business owners and identifying the biggest problems with answers and identifying the biggest solutions with to the struggles and actually bringing these ideal, perfect customers on and talking them through the process and recording it and then putting it out to the world so you're helping out so many people on a scaled and leverageable way and then drawing in even more of your ideal clients because they're like, man, like I'm getting so much value from hearing Matt break down this content for other people. Like I need to hire him for, I need to hire his brain for me. And now you're no longer wasting your time, which would be what this other show is. And you're u- utilizing your time in a much more scaled and leverageable way. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. Yeah, no, that's, that's right down the vision that I was having. And so I, I guess kind of my point B to that, that directly what you just said was I'm still working in the corporate world. And this consultancy is going to be uh, essentially a, a side hustle, obviously, at, at the beginning. Would you wait if you were me just for non-compete and those type of things because I currently am in a sales type of role? Would you wait until I retire from my corporate job to start that and really get that going? Or do you think that matters a whole lot? Absolutely not. I would start immediately because nobody's going to listen to your show for a significant amount of time. It's going to take a while to get any traction and momentum. And if any person that has to do with any management level of your business stumbles across your show, show somehow and is butt hurt, like you always want to ask for forgiveness, not permission. You can be like, oh, I literally had no idea. I thought this was just making me a better salesman and you know better for this company. But if you want me to stop, I'll stop. Yeah, I'll make it happen. And then you do that, but you've already now had a time where you've gotten better at your craft, you've actually learned some things, and maybe you've even built a little bit of an audience up at this point that you can kind of keep you know, hovering around until you are ready to make that leap. Definitely, definitely. The second part of my question, and this will be a, a little bit more streamlined than the first part, is as I start and you know, I'm bringing on beta clients and uh, I already have a couple that have committed that are good friends of mine, um, but as I'm bringing on a few more, what are your thoughts on discount pricing because they're new or should I just go right in and, and start with my uh, my full pricing? Thoughts? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word discount pricing, but I mean, there's just no problem with kind of like structuring it as like early bird pricing by just saying like, listen, like I am starting this up. You're going to be like my early bird. You're going to be my test group. So because you're beta, like use that kind of phrase, that kind of language, that kind of vocabulary, because you're going to be my beta group, my test group, my early birds, and you're going to help me develop this program into what it is you are going to get in at this price point and going in the future, it's going to double or triple this, you know, and and soon it's going to be quadruple this. So that is the way that I would kind of structure that. And there's definitely no problem with getting people excited about being in that beta group. Great. That's exactly what I was hoping for. Thanks guys. I appreciate the space. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, So we're running out of time. We got five minutes left. JLD. I got two quick questions for you and then we're going to close up real quick. Run room for podcasts and audio. If somebody says podcast still good, audio still good, what do you think? What do you think about that? Um, what was the question, Joe? Sorry. You like the run room for audio and podcasts? Do you still think we've got a long way to go? A lot of growth left in podcasts. Listen, audio is an amazing medium. Clubhouse has only like triple confirmed that with you know it's unbelievable kind of bursting onto the scene. The reality is this. If you're able to utilize a format, a platform like podcasting, like audio, to provide the best number one solution to a real problem, you will win. If you provide a vague, broad topic, second solution, all the way to infinity, you will lose. And that is truer today than it ever has been. It will continue to be the case. Yeah, I think that's on on every platform. That's the advice. You can't be too niche. Uh, and, and people always go too broad. Last question, my friend. We've got a lot of people in the audience. We've got a lot of people on the podcast listening. They want to grow their content creation business. They want to be successful content entrepreneurs like you have. What would be the one thing you would tell them right now that they to do, to think about, that they can become a successful content entrepreneur? Well, number one, you've just got to get Joe's book. And I mean, he didn't he didn't ask me to say that, but I mean, it's just the reality. This guy has proven to be the content marketing genius for well over a decade now. And that's not going to change anytime soon. Um, and, and that's just the reality. I mean, you got to invest in yourself and by investing, I don't mean 
just like the 20 books, 20 bucks that it costs to buy the book or, you know, other books that are, you know, similar. It's the time that it takes to read, consume, and then implement this. And so there's going to be like no one sentence answer I can give that's going to be of meaningful value beyond something that I've been saying all episode, which is completely true, which is you've got to identify the best solution to a real problem that you are uniquely skilled and qualified to provide, then find the right people that produce the right contents in your area and consume their contents via books, podcasting, other platforms. Make that a priority. Love it, my friend. Really appreciate it. Congratulations on everything. Before I close this out, JLD, where's the best place people can get more information about you? eofire.com is my headquarters. I got a lot of free courses for entrepreneurs there. Of course, I recently published a book, The Common Path to Uncommon Success, which you can find at any bookstore online or offline. And um, eofire.com slash subscribe if you want to subscribe to my podcast, Entrepreneurs on Fire. Thank you, sir. And both your books are fantastic. Love Common Path. And then for anyone that really wants to find their way through journaling, the, your journal is fantastic. So I can't. Okay, back to Joe now. Something that JLD commented on just a little bit, but I want to go into. He batches all his content. Generally, he produces eight episodes in one day. And he does this sometimes months before he releases the episodes. This gives him the flexibility to work one or two days a week. He is surely living his best life and has decided not to sell his business, but to create a lifestyle brand around the business. JLD's case study is a fitting end to our Content Inc. book series. For right now, we're going to go back to our Monday-only podcast, but if you'd like to hear something specific, please hit me up at Joe Polizzi on Twitter. Thanks, and talk to you Monday.